Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are live again today. It's already 4.33. We are almost three minutes late. Uh, may I introduce to you Mr. Roy Anderson from England. He is a recognized global educational expert with almost 40 years in the development of school system and has a personal following of 2,500 educationists around the world. He is much appraised for his many years of scientific research into what intelligence is, how to improve the operation of school, and how teachers can teach better. He has devoted all of his adult life to the better development of children and has assisted in the designing and planning of social and educational programs with the Ministry of Education of Denmark, Latvia, and Nepal. He has much experience in educational planning, but is also a trained hearing impaired and visually impaired teacher, a specialist in Petro's conductive education for disabled children and is an expert in intelligence. He is the inventor of the brain environment complex theory, which presents a new concept to what intelligence is and how children learn. He travels the world to explain to politicians, educationists and parents why school fails today and why and how each school can raise the platform of its students, sorry, performance of its students. But more important, why we need to prepare our children with higher skills for the very different world they must live and work in. Our failing in this will deprive the future global citizens of the higher language skills they will need to maintain democracy in a world dominated by artificial intelligence. Through his great experience in teaching, he has developed the Anderson Attitude Method of Teaching, which is widely accepted as a simple but highly effective means for the normal teacher to dramatically improve the learning and grades of all of their students. He has recently conducted and has been conducting it since in past also Teacher training courses in England, Algeria, Nepal, India, Turkey, Thailand, Indonesia, Australia, and many more countries. His seven books are say, said by professors of education world, the world to be some of the best written books about school, society, and learning. Let's welcome Mr. Roy Anderson. Good evening, Mr. Anderson. How are you? Namaste, my friend. I'm very fine. Namaste. But it's nice to see you again. Thank you so much. So, sir, uh, normally I start my conversation with what brings you to education? I think that I was, it began when I was five, when I was five years old. I very clearly remember my mother taking me to school on day one. And I grabbed hold of the railings, screaming, I'm not going in there. <laughs> and I think you know, most of my 12 years of school was, was kind of similar along those lines. Um, but more seriously, um, when I was 16, you know, when I was at school, I really didn't understand what was I was, I was bullied. I was insecure. I, I couldn't talk to my teacher and get them to help me to understand what was happening. If I, if I dared to ask a question, I didn't risk. I accepted the response and I said, yes, sir, even though I didn't understand it. There were too many pressures on me to change from that at that time. Um, and then when I was 16, they said, Roy, you're not clever enough to do mathematics for your final examinations, you must do arithmetic. So at 17, I took my final examinations in English, arithmetic, history, geography, and all those subjects. And um, I had always wanted to be a doctor for children. And I remember opening the envelope when it came back and it was, Zero, 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 zero. I got completely zero. I failed everything. Well, I did other things in my life. And when I was 20, I went back to school. Two things had changed for me significantly. One, I'd been in the army. And the army had taught me a sense of self-responsibility, but also the fact that if I, if I had to do something, then I could do it. And that gave me the, the strength to respectfully argue with the teacher if I didn't do which is tremendously important. But also, I wanted to see the world. I wanted to meet people in other cultures and see other countries. And of course, I had no money. 
The only way I could do that was to join the Navy. So to get into the Navy, I needed a, a school certificate. And for that purpose, I went uh, back to college or went into college when I was 20 years old. With those two factors of having a purpose and having a sense of self-control over the learning process, in the end of the first year, I was the top student and I came top in every examination. And when I finally left, I had equivalents of, uh, or, or, they were all 90% passes in, in above A-level, uh, UK A-level. And um, I remember I got, I think it was 92% in applied mathematics. And it was amazing for me that I failed arithmetic when I was 17, and, I, and yet when I was 24, I could I'd do so well in mathematics. Um, but then I did other things, and um, in my 30s, I asked myself a question. I just wondered if children still had trouble to learn as I did. And I found out that nothing had changed. In every lesson, you'll have one child, maybe two, who really understands what was going on. But most of the children, when they leave the classroom, they'll say to the friend, what was that about? <laughs> of course, they don't understand. So, so that was, right. it, it was, it was then a desire to help all the children. I never wanted one child to fail in education as I'd done. And so because of that, then I began to research and work in school. All right. So, uh, like, as much as I know, is that you have been researching into education, how the brain works, how intelligence works, everything. And once while we were talking, in fact, when I met you for the last time, you uh, explained to me very clearly that intelligence is not inherited from parents. Right now, what, I have two yeah. questions. I have two questions. One is. How long did you research into education? And secondly, what made you research that intelligence is not inherited? Um, they're both very important questions. I, I actually dedicated 10 years of my life. I, I didn't work for 10 years. Of course, they did odd jobs and we, we, we survived. But for 10 years, I taught myself everything about human development from uh, from the conception, from the embryo, from the fetus, how the, how the brain develops and how intelligence develops through the fetus and is affected by the mother's you know, emotions, chemistry, and then how it's affected after birth. And then, of course, then I, I, I studied um, everything about genetics, neurology, social, political science, technology, as we'll come to in a moment, because that's tremendously important. That actually drives education. And the whole, everything to do with human development, I became fascinated with uh, how every individual related to the world about them, from a child who was deaf and blind, to one who was deaf, to, uh, to one who had a motor problem, to one who appeared normal, and to those who seemed to be gifted in some way. And what I richly found is everything comes down to just sensitivity, and this is based on emotion. Um, the aspect of intelligence I think that it was tremendously important because when I began to, you know, in my 30s, I would go to schools and I would say to teachers, why are these children so different? Why is this one or two so really smart and the rest kind of struggle? There's one or two who are really stupid, the troublemakers. And the answer came back to me, well, they're born different. You know, we are all born different. Some are born tall, short, you know, fat, thin, uh, big nose, big ears, long chin, short hair, you know, green hair, whatever it is. And I thought, is it really true that we really do inherit a factor of intelligence? Because then I looked at my own life and I thought, you know, when 17, I was, they said I had a very low genetic count. And when I was 24, they said, wow, you've got a very big genetic count. Um, so what really, why do we really think that intelligence is inherited? And it's a very, very long story. And I've made some videos about this, but basically I went way back to right through the beginnings of psychology to its origins in 1879. There was a guy called William Wundt in Leipzig who opened his first laboratory. And everything about psychology built up from Wundt. But where did Wundt get his ideas? I discovered that Wundt was heavily influenced by a man called Francis Galton. And this, of course, is a very long story. But Galton was not a psychologist at, at that time. He was, a, he was tremendously inf interested in maintaining a political stability in the world that he knew. The 19th century was a great time of political turmoil. 
Uh, basically, what had happened, well, I mean, this is a very big subject. Basically, what happened is that we'd moved from the agricultural to the industrial phase in, in Europe. And this had brought people in the agricultural era were under the control of the landowners. They couldn't do what they wanted to do. They had no freedom. They were conditioned and contained by the power of the landowner. But when we moved into the industrial era, there was a need for people to man the factories. So people were brought from the fields into the towns, which expanded into big cities, to feed the machinery, you know, the factories. And come together, these people realized that we have a way to control our own life. This was the breeding point of socialism. And that sparked off all kinds of revolutions. And in fact, the 19th century was the age of assassination. There were more attempts, attempts on the lives of the royal families in Europe than in any other time in our history over 2,000 years in, in, in European history. Um, and it was a tremendous time of great fear for the establishment. They could see these people wanting to a better life, but that meant that they would lose their quality of life and how to maintain it. And of course, well, in 1848, there was a revolution in Paris that spread like wildfire, and every country in Europe had a revolution into a revolution, except England for a particular reason. The kings and queens fled their countries, they went back to England. They went to England for safety. And this, the, the people were then, they, were, they exploded in the rights, equal rights, free speech, free newspapers. There was a great gaiety. But of course, the, the, the monarchs, the emperors, they, they wanted their control back. So they came back with militia and soldiers, and they squashed the revolution. In the, uh, in the 30th of June, 1848, um, there was about 3,000 people just dragged out of the houses and executed in the streets. The whole revolution was stopped, completely finished. But from 1848 until 1914, the whole of Europe was a nest bed of spies and informers trying to find out who the socialists were, intimidate them to keep them quiet or put them in jail or even exile them. So the, so the system, the political system, contained. There was a kind of stability. And, but, but the problem really was how to maintain this. I mean, previously they'd used military force uh, you know, executions and, and uh, frightening people. But there was some greater need that was required. And actually, it came from the Greek philosopher Socrates. In a conversation with Glauton, Socrates was asked the question, how can we maintain political stability? How can we get everybody just to accept the life that they've got, they were born into? And he said that we would, um, we would, we would say that the gods created three kinds of men gold, silver, brass, or iron. And then we would issue an oracle that if the men of brass or iron, you know, the low levels ever came to control the state, the state would collapse. And that fed right through all our civilizations, the idea that you can't be a king or a queen unless you've got blue, blue, blue blood. Um, and in 1855, de Gobney wrote his Inequality of Human Races, which basically followed Socrates and said that if the lower classes ever came to rule the state, the state would collapse. Um, and that inspired Galton to actually, he was terrified, he was tremendously wealthy and influential person as to how, he, what he could do to maintain his political stability. And he did. And he wrote a book in 1869 called Hereditary Genius, which basically set the guidelines that in every society, you will have an elite ruling factor. These people will be more capable to rule the rest. And these people can be identified by their physical features, whatever it happens to be, because these physical features prove the mental capacity inside. So if you inherit this, then you inherit this. And that means that because the, the father, the grandfather, the great, great grandfather was the judge or the king or whatever it is, then this son has the right to do that. But of course, that was way before we discovered anything about the brain. Uh, what we now know is that the cerebral cortex is the top part of the brain. It's not influenced genetically, and it is developed purely through environmental information, which is why the children of today will have a different brain than we've got, because their brain is influenced in different ways. But anyway, in a very short story. Then I began to study, the, you know, the psychometrics and psychology and everything like that. And basically, every IQ test that was developed, and so the SAT test, still today, as it's used, although unwittingly, is, is a, for, for a political agenda. It's used to prove that people, one race, one color, one political gender, one social level, are better than others, and therefore they should have opportunities in education or in life because of that. And uh, the book that I wrote 
it took me 10 years to write it and whatever. Whoops, there we go. Uh, this proves for the first time that intelligence is not genetically inherited. And if you go into that, you can find out the lies, fraud, deceit by the leading psychologists to convince civilization that intelligence is inherited for political purposes. So, for example, in 1955, the Bell Curve was published in America, which tried to prove that white people are 15 points higher in intelligence than black people in Hispanics, and therefore whites should be given better opportunities than blacks because they won't waste the money, they'll make a better society. But of course, when we looked into the statistics in that book, it was just lies, it was just misinterpretation of data and, and manipulation factors. There was nothing in it. Every normally book, so there was a woman, you know, you can take all these psychometric tests, which actually don't really prove anything. And of course, we can go into that, uh, but that's not the point here, is that it all comes, it basically comes down to what do we really know? You must understand that these psychometric tests, these uh, factor analysis or correlation coefficients, they only look at data. But the, the, with, there's, no, there's no real factor where that data comes from and how it's interpreted. And, that we can go into at another time. But there was a woman called Nancy Bailey, and she devised the best infantile testing system, widely recognized in the world. And she stated that after 50 years and 50,000 infants, that between zero to 14 months, there is no discernible difference in the intelligence of an infant to relate to information or to use language. Of course, you know, cry and, and relate to information like that. Of course, babies has for, for for specific cries. Uh, you know, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm frightened, I need attention. And I actually can recognize some of those. Um, so when I'm watching a movie and I hear a baby crying, I think, for goodness sake, you know, the baby's sleeping or the baby needs food, whatever. You know, I can recognize those cries, uh, whatever. Anyway, so my friend. So, uh, like, uh, we have been discussing about uh, intel inherited intelligence and art. And uh, uh, as far as I know, you've written almost around seven books, right? Which I have also read some of them when you were here, you had shared them with me. Uh, so uh, like what made you write all these books? Most of them basically are on child development, right? Education and society, right? So uh, yeah. what motivated you to write them? Um, well, basically, I began as a PhD, but then I realized this was very academic, and the purpose of what I was doing was that I really wanted to help every parent, because it is the parent more than the teacher who really is responsible for the education of the child. Of course, we can come into that. And, and so um, what I realized was that we think of school and children learning, but it is not that simple. It is the whole political social mechanism that, that drives society with lots of strategies hidden into education and with strategies that are hidden to enable the citizen worker to come out of this educational process. So if we have the idea that we send the child to school at the age of five, they go all the way through school and they get a piece of paper at the end and they get a job, it is not as simple as that. There are so many hidden agendas within it to make sure that we devise a particular kind of quality citizen at the output, which is unfair to a lot of children. So my first book, The Illusion of Education, explains that education is really a fallacy. We don't teach children how to learn. We process children on language skills. We can go into that for a moment. But the idea that the teacher teaches the child is not true. The child learns by their own drive. Uh, but of course, there are many disturbing factors that they have to struggle through within this educational process. Basically, all schools around the world today still work on a 19th century ideology to produce either the manager or the managed. And there are so many strategies laid within the society and within the school to ensure that children do not get equal opportunity. So that some children, for whatever reason, are propelled towards the university where they are taught evaluators' thinking skills, to for the greater responsibility they'll have in society and industry. For the rest of the kids, those who just move through the school system and enter college or to work, whatever it is, they are not taught how to think. They are accepted on the way they do think, and they're processed on their ability in that, which we can come to. And then, of course, then it was a great need to prove, you know, 
So, so you'll get so many teachers who will have two students and they'll ask the same question to one student, I know the answer. And the other student says, well, I don't know, I can't understand. And the teacher will try to explain and the child will still say, I don't get it. So the teacher says, well, we know about meiosis, genetic diversity, therefore one, they're born differently. The smart kid is born differently and the one less able is born stupid. I'm sorry, but that's life. And it's not. And so I spent so many years to prove why, to teach us to understand that every child, every normally born child in that class has the same potential to get the highest marks possible if they believe it and if they get the child to believe it and they can help the child to, to correct what they misunderstood in the long development. Sometimes it began six months ago, one year ago, five years ago, whatever it is. But if you can correct that basis and help them to believe that they can do better, miracles happen. But then, of course, I... then... Yeah, please, so, please, well, please. Then, yeah, okay, so then I wrote The Brain Environment Complex, which is a new concept to what intelligence is. I have to get away from this idea that we are born with something and something develops. That, again, was a political agenda. It came by Francis Spear, sorry, Charles Spearman in 1904. You know, in the 19th century, they didn't know what intelligence is, and we're still arguing about what it is today. But at that time, it was a lot of social fights, like how religious you were, how much of a criminal you were, and all these factors were tied in with the factor of intelligence. And this was the time when they were trying to measure or begin to measure intelligence. And in actual fact, you cannot measure human intelligence. If you understand genetics, you know that you cannot go from the population to the individual because it's too different. It's, it's too unfathomable to, to measure. But then, then um, so it was Spearman. Look, let's forget all these ideas about what intelligence might or might not be. Let's just say that a child inherits something and it develops. And that was the basis of what we call the nature and natural ratio, which I've subsequently disproven. So I studied neurology, how the brain okay. really works. And how uh, like we, we, we have been uh, discussing earlier also, like what should be the way really schools work? How should the school really work? That is what we've been discussing many a times. But uh, at the end, the system that is going on, we cannot just... Uh, flow away from it or we cannot just drift away from it. So according to you, how does school really work? Because you've been an expert in training teachers uh, across the globe. You yourself have been a good researcher. And I guess your research on education, schooling and everything has uh, in a way motivated you to write uh, these wonderful books. OK. Um in the, in the first instance, to answer your question, as, uh, as we are born and as we are raised through our culture and as teachers are trained, teachers have this belief that you inherit something and it develops. So that if a child has a problem, it's because related either socioeconomic problem or something that they can't touch that comes from a genetic factor. And so they give up. That's the first thing. Now, the way the school really works is that a child enters school and proceeds school through three factors. First of all, it's the home environment. How well, sorry, just, okay. What is the, what is the role of the, of, the, of the parent in this? Uh, in 1995, Risley and Hart did a lot of research on the effect of the parent. And they found out that parents who come from an, have an academic background, they are less, trusting for education. They know the teacher doesn't have time to help their child. So they spend more time in the child's development prior to school. They read stories, which is fundamental. They take the child on excursions to open their perspective of the world, you know, to the zoo or whatever. They go on walks in the forest and things like that. They can involve them in adventures and they take things apart and put them together again so the child understands things. They're beginning to understand things. They teach them how to read, how to write, and how to do simple mathematics. So they're developing a kind of a mind focus. This is so important. A focusing mind and a mental stamina to keep up with information as it's moving. They're not distracted. Less. And these children, at the age of three years and four years old, they had something like 30 million words more in their vocabulary than children from normal parents. You might be talking 20, 80 in the population percentage, for example. The important thing is that when these children begin school in day one, they are more focused, they are more ready, disciplined to, to work with the flow of information. So the first...
I think there is an internet issue. Yes. So uh, what Mr. Anderson has been really doing is he has dedicated the entire life, as I mentioned earlier also, to the development of students, development of teachers. And that is what all Anderson attitude is. Uh, I guess he is uh, having some internet issues. Uh, he will be back. Till then, let me tell you some more things about him. As a human being, he ha today he is a self-made person. Um, you can view his website where you can get all the information about all the books. The website is... Yes, I think he's back. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, we lost you for some time. Uh, it, 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 I was just telling them, I was just telling our viewers that, uh, that uh, what kind of a person you are and how you, ha you are a self-made man and the books that you've written are just your dedication and your passion to work for children that have motivated you to do that. And secondly, I was just about to tell you about the website where they can find your books. So I think it will be better you only tell them. Okay. Well, the website is um, www.andersenroy, no, that's A-N-D-E-R-S-E-N-R-O-Y dot com. But if we just go back to what we were talking about, the three factors of a child's development, so how school works. So the parents. Um, We've explained the importance of the parents. This is fundamental. So you have, for example, a parent, you know, a very good, basically the mother, because often the father's out doing his job, you know, but basically the mother's a grinding factor here by the sense of making sure that the child is ready for school, has a breakfast. So many children go to school without any food, so they get, you know, a lot of, they don't get the, the glucose and oxygen working in the brain, so they get tired and they can't keep going, they get distracted and bored. And then, of course, the mother will make sure that they've had a good food when they come home. They're rest relaxing and more dedicated about make sure you do your homework by yourself. Then you can play your games. This is tremendously important. Um, but then once the child is in school, that's where the problem is. Because school is, because the classroom is very competitive environment. From the day one, one child will be wanting to say to the teacher, oh, look at me, I'm a better, I'm better, give me a better mark, give me a goal, so I'm a nice kid. And they'll try to help hurt other children so the children appear less competent. And that goes on right the way through, and including into adult education. This, this personality attacks on other students to try to make some students appear more prominent, more competent is... is uh, I, I have a question. Person. I have a question in between. Sorry to interrupt. What, according to you, are the main problems for a child in learning? Because right now we are discussing... Uh, what the child does in school. So according to you, because uh, you also have been in uh, teaching schools and all, you've been a you are at present a principal somewhere. Uh, so what are the main problems for children in learning? Um, okay. Uh, um, first of all, it's the competitiveness of the classroom. Uh, children are affected by the egos and remarks of other children, and that inhibits their ability to interact with information. So, um, so first of all, if a child has a purpose, if they, I want to be a doctor, I want to be an astronaut, or whatever it is, or a train driver, whatever it is, they have their purpose to come to school, they have their purpose to want to learn, to try to do the best they can. Then, of course, as they distracting factor how how maybe children you know children, some children are abused at home and um, and when they come to school they can't release that it, it's the it's blocking their ability to 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 understand what's happening more importantly if a child is bullied or a child is intimidated this causes a change in their brain chemistry this is very important to talk about perhaps the most important thing we can talk about right now is really how the brain works in this sense we have to understand that, um, first of all, in order for the brain to process information, there's it in three parts. 
It interrogates information. So if the student is caused to be happy or interested or fascinated by the teacher, so they'll struggle to listen or they'll try to read better. Now this drive to want to understand in clear precision causes the information to go very neatly into their memory networks so that other information they've stored with equal uh, precision is very easy to link. They say, well, I understand what he means. I recognize it. I know the answer. But if the child is, or the student at any age, is bored or distracted, then this information is kind of vague and it's connecting with information that was vague from the last lesson and they can't see the connection. I don't know the answer. Um, and, and then, of course, once they do know the answer, it's how they present their mind. And this comes to language, which is one of the things we've got to come back to in a moment as to how school works. So their ability to express their mind verbally or in writing is what they're evaluated on. And this basically comes back to how efficient they are in telling a story, which is why it's so important for parents to tell stories to children right throughout their childhood. I mean, I was telling a story to my children every night. And then when they were about 15 years old, they locked the door to start me coming in to tell them stories. <laughs> but um, stories are fundamental. It, they, they create vocabulary, enable the children to understand different scenarios, different perspectives, imagination, and it gives them the ability to put their thoughts together in a concrete sequence so they get better presentations. Um, but um, it, so this factor of uh, rather than saying how able a child is, it's more interesting to say how disabled they are by the factors of, of, of uh, distraction. Let me explain to you. You know very well the brain has got a lot of neurons, brain cells. This is one brain cell, this is another brain cell. They do not touch, there's a gap. We call it a synaptic gap. And what happens is the electrical impulse will move along the neuron, be carried by a chemical to the next neuron, and move through the brain alternating chemical electrical, chemical electrical. Now there are 50 chemicals neurotransmitters. One of these is called cortisol. This is very important in education. Cortisol saves your life outside the classroom. Inside the classroom, it can destroy your opportunities in education and so on. It works like this. Imagine you're out walking. You're, you're out in the countryside, blue sky, green trees. You're very happy. You're relaxed. You see a flower, beautiful red flower. And you look down. You're interested. You look down. You examine it. You remember other flowers you'd seen, other shapes, petals, textures, smells. You're having a learning experience. Suddenly, there's a noise you see a snake and your mind says danger now as soon as your mind says danger according to the level of danger it triggers it causes a chemical change in your body one of the things it does it causes this cortisol to overproduce these chemicals are always moving so then they overproduce and floods the frontal cortex and it blocks this synaptic gap so that the signals are not transferring you're just you're in a brain freeze you're looking at the flower and you're just looking at the flower and you're looking at the flower and you Nothing's happening, you're just looking. Because the other part of your brain is saying, deal with the danger and run away. Now for children or an adult in the educational process, if they feel there is a danger, if they feel other children are laughing at them because their nose is too long, they've got a poor clothes, or they come from a different kind of a family background or something like that, or somebody's going to beat them up after school, any type of a fear like that will cause the cortisol to rise and the child will not be able to think. I remember going to one school in Nepal and the teacher came and he had no idea about teaching. He thought it was great. He came onto the blackboard, he wrote on the blackboard, brrr, and he shouted to the children, do you understand? And everyone said, yes, sir. Nobody did. And he carried on, brrr, do you understand? Everyone said, yes, sir. <laughs> Nobody understood anything. And then there was one boy who was in the back, was just like, and he said, you boy, stand up. Now, when that boy stood up, he was so embarrassed. He, he was... I knew exactly what had happened. He was so embarrassed, so the cortisol, there was a danger, the cortisol rose level, and he couldn't see, he couldn't think. He could, his brain just could not work with anything. And the teacher was getting more angry with him because the child didn't respond, because the child couldn't respond, because his brain was frozen. And I said to the boy, look, please just sit down and relax. But for the rest of that lesson, that boy was watching that board like this to give the impression he knew exactly what was going on, but I knew for that lesson, and probably for the rest of that day, his brain wasn't functioning. I've had, a, I've had similar experiences of that, so I know exactly what happens. So of course, there are two aspects here. One is that once this cortisol is triggered, it can last for a day, 
if if the child is repeatedly abused or bullied or insulted, it can last for many, many years, many years. And that can interfere with their ability to process information. Uh, there's a lot of research done on that. But so that's one factor. There's so many interesting points. You've got to keep me on, on track here because otherwise we'll zoom off in a different direction. Definitely, definitely I'll do that. Okay, definitely okay. I'll do that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, so the ability of the child. Um, okay, what well, I've got confused now. But what is? What are we up to? What is the process of the school? Help me. What is the last question? Yeah. Dealing with? What does? Uh, like, what are the problems? We we've discussed. In fact, what are the main problems for children in learning? Uh, uh, I guess uh, what you've said is uh, like uh, we as teachers and parents, we need to make it very clear to ourselves that we do not trigger the cortisol in the child's brain so that his ability to learn his ability to learn the, and perceive what is being taught we, does not get him is, that's very very true unfortunately a lot of teachers think that they they need to be authoritative in order to control the minds of the children. You know, sit down, be quiet. I'm the boss here. Shut up. In fact, uh, I, uh, today I was discussing it with a parent. Uh, these days, you you are quite aware that all over the world, online classes are going on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, online education is going on, rather, for school children. Are all. A girl is in class two, right? And she was, uh, like, there was an essay given. She wrote it to her. Uh, like she had written it in her full capacity. I think that was the best. So the teacher who was online, she was literally shouting on her, saying that um, uh, you have written it wrong. Then the parent had to step in. And then again, the teacher after, uh, like in the other class, one of the classes, like because of that, those uh, words, you know, the girl was really very, very upset. The teacher literally told him, if you don't do it this way, I'm going to throw you out of the class. Well, the teacher needs to be thrown out of the school <laughs> completely. So this um, is actually, you know, this is what is happening. You know, the teachers are not ready to, uh, I'm not uh, branding or I'm not just uh, tagging anybody. But the fact is that this is going on and we need to take care of it. We need to take care of it. We as individuals, we need to make it very clear to everybody that we are not teaching the children out of just uh, sheer uh, happiness that, okay, we are just going to let them do whatever they want to do. No, we are teaching them well, to build a they... better future. Well, okay, okay. We've got so much to talk about here, and that's the purpose of the methodology that I've developed, is to create a, a learning environment through love, you know? But of course, many teachers don't understand what that means in a learning context. It means to give security and stability. Um, so, uh, incidentally, what you just this teacher you just remarked, they're everywhere. I remember in England, there was one girl who the, the math teacher said to the girl in front of all the all the class, "You're so stupid. Why are you in my class?" I mean, this is not a teacher. You know, this, this is what kind of a person is this teaching people? Because once you insult a person, once you hurt them or take away any respect, cortisol goes up and they can't think. They don't believe in themselves. They dis you destroy their opportunities. Um, but my friend, we've got to keep on track here because of the, there are so many factors we need to talk about. How does school really work? Okay, we talked about the three factors. We talked about the child before school, the child in school, and the quality of the teacher. It is the teacher's purpose to really inspire the child to want to learn, to want to put the effort in to keeping up with what's happening. That's the real purpose of the teacher. Now, unfortunately, the way school actually works, this is so important, school does not work on intelligence. We think it does. We, we, give, inf we give information to children, open your textbooks and tell them you've got a problem. And at the end, the teacher will mark it and blah, blah, blah. So the child who does the best presentation, the teacher thinks, well, they are smarter, they are more intelligent than the child who does less, less. So this comes back to this, what we talked about, this inherited intelligence. School's got nothing to do with intelligence, zero. School, school works on languages. There are two languages, mathematics or early French, English, Chinese, Japanese, whatever it is. 
And these languages work on rules. <coughs> now, if the child is motivated to want to understand the rule when the teacher's talking about it, they're not distracted by other thoughts, fears, but they can concentrate on it. They have a sense of security and they practice that rule. Oh man, then they know how to think with that rule. And as one rule builds upon that and that and that and that, so they know how to think with these rules. Now these rules in mathematics are to understand how to transpose numbers, how to move numbers about. Once you know how to do that, you're good in maths and you're good in the applied sciences, physics and chemistry, which is formulas. When you know the rules of how to spell a word, when you know the rules of grammar, you know, to put the common, the full stop in the right place, you know the rules of syntax, to put the right word here and there, and you know how, the rules of how to tell a story. Then you'll get a good pres you'll give a good presentation, and you'll get a good mark. And so the child who understands these rules, they know how to negotiate through any learning task, and it's fun. They, I, I can do this, I like this, I'm good at it, therefore I'm creative, and that's where, that's, then they go exploring how they can use what they're learning in other uh, aspects which is then developing. In fact, in you fact I, think you, uh, I think you will also agree uh, that uh, if we make education and teaching interesting for the child, all children can excel. We just need to change our methodology of teaching. And I think that is what all Anderson, um, Anderson attitude of uh, met, uh, attitude method of teacher, teaching is. Yes, it's very, very true. The, the method I've developed First of all, I, I explain to the teachers why intelligence is not genetically inherited, and then why school performance is not intelligence, as I've just explained to you. It's the ability to keep up with these rules. Now, I, 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 I'd like to show you a demonstration. Can I give you a demonstration about that? Because it's really important here. Can I do that? Hello? Yes, you can Hello? do that. Uh, you can, yeah, you can do that. Okay, just let me find. Uh, yeah. Okay, just hold on a second. Uh, <clears throat> just a simple demonstration. Just wait a minute. Here we go. Okay. Now I got a screen show. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So you can see this. Can you see this equation? Six divided by two, two plus one. Just a minute. I'm Hello? just adding. Just, just yeah. <clears throat> can Can you see it? Yeah, we can. Yes, we can okay. see it, Mr. Anderson. Okay. No. Okay. No, we're going to look. Now, this is this is a rule. It's an example of a rule. So we look at two students: one who learned the rule and one who didn't learn the rule. Now, this student. He didn't learn the rule. When the teacher was explaining the rule, his mind was on something else. He was he was thinking that, oh, they don't like me, or they good, they hate me, or, or rather, I love that girl, or I'm going to play football with the boy, whatever. His mind was not focused. So when the teacher explained the rule, he didn't get it. He didn't listen. So he said, well, it's very simple. I'll use logic. Well, you can see here, two plus one is three, and six divided by two is three. So three times three is nine. Now that's just logic, and it appears to be correct, but it's totally wrong because he didn't know the rule. Now this boy learned the rule, which is bod mass. So first of all, number one, you must do the bracket. So two plus one is three. Number two, you do the multiplication, which is two times three is six. And thirdly, you do the division. Six divided by six is one. This has got nothing to do with intelligence. It is just simply learning the rules. Now, um, just hold on a minute. Um, there's so much. Um, I just want to find another example. Look at this example here. Now, you'll see the teacher is teaching the children how to draw letter A. It's an example. It could be anything, you know, Pythagoras, whatever. Now, the little girl is very happy. She loves the teacher. And, and I've, talked, I, I've developed a theory called imprinting. That basically means that you align your way of thinking to somebody that you like or you dislike. In other words, if you love somebody, you'll try to be them. If you don't, if you feel uncomfortable with somebody, you'll distance 
yourself from what they're trying to explain to you in a very simple sense. But you see the girl here, she loves the teacher, she's very happy, and she wants to do the A the best way she can to the teacher. Now the boy on the, on, on the teacher's left, well, he's happy, but he wants to go and play football. So his mind's on plug football. He's thinking about the bell going so he can run around with his friends. So his concentration is less. So at the end of the lesson, the teacher says, right, everybody's done their A with their variation. Next week, we'll go on to the next, you know, B, C, whatever it happens to be. Now, the problem in the reality is that the boy's ability to do the A was caused by lack of concentration. The problem is the next lesson and the next year, it's said to be his ability. And therefore, then nothing is done to try to improve him. I look at this example here. You see here a girl who'd been in school for eight years. Now, what she's written here is totally right. There's nothing wrong with what she's written. But look at the presentation. So the marks are average. She thinks of herself as average. She believes she's average. She doesn't believe she can do any better because for eight years she's been told she is average. But I, I said to her, look, I want to show you how to do letters. So I told her calligraphy. I showed her how to do the A and the B and the C. And she said to me, wow, this is beautiful. Now, when she said it's beautiful, I knew that she was having her purpose to want to learn to put the effort in because she had a belief in herself. Now, you remember, this is eight years, eight teachers, eight years. Two weeks later, she did that. Two weeks later. Now she gets top marks. How we teach um, is what they become. And there's, there's so many more examples of that. I mean, and, you know, if we want to talk about, oh, so, so much. I mean, um, you know, I mean, this, you know, this is really what we see. This, this graph here, this bell curve, the standard distribution, it's supposed to be intelligence. As I, I've proved, this is not applicable. But you see a range of students and one teacher, and they were, and, you know, one girl in the front will get a good mark, and one boy in the back will get a bad mark, and everybody else get marks in between. And they'll say, well, more or less, it's what they're born with, but they're not. It's just understanding how the brain relates to information. So if so, if we come back to this idea, let me just stop the sharing. If, okay, if we come back to the idea that education is based on rules, then if the teacher enables the children to be happy and relaxed and a bit of fun and humour, but remember this cortisol goes up when the students are disturbed or frightened, it comes down when they're happy. So if the teacher makes it fun and interesting, cortisol goes down so far they can concentrate, and then they can entice the students into their mind. I remember talking with one, some group of teachers, and I told them that they have to be actors. And one teacher said to me, I'm not an actor, I'm a teacher. But he didn't understand what I meant, because to be an actor and a teacher, you have to entertain minds. You have to pull them into the interest of the subject to get them focused and fascinated about what you're going to teach them. And so that, 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 that was that. Um, and, and so if, if teachers really understand that all children have the same potential to get top marks and that the children display different abilities because they misunderstood early rules, like the boy doing the mathematics, then all the teachers got to do is to give them a, a factor of self-belief. And, you know, when you don't know the rule and you see other children doing it, you think they are better than me, therefore I'm no good, therefore I don't believe in myself and I hate this sort of thing. I, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. That's the biggest problem. Children don't believe they can do things. Now, I explained to you that I completely failed arithmetic, but when I was 20, I went back to school and my math teacher, God bless him, he took me, you know, he would say to me, Roy, what are you trying to do? And I said, I don't know. He said, look, it's just a game. I said, a game? Wow, it's not, it's not life-threatening. I, I can survive. And, it, and he said to me, look, there is a, there is a goal. You've got, to, you've got to solve this problem. And some of the parts are hidden. And when he explained the maths like that, suddenly the stress went far away. Huh. And it became interesting. How could I do that? And I got, you know, I got, I got really, really good at maths. So, sir, yeah, I, have, I, have a question. I have a question for you here. We have been discussing about a child's intelligence, right? So uh, what is the importance of a child's intelligence in school? As I've explained to you, well, first of all, let's understand that we do not have intelligence. The idea that we have intelligence came from Charles Spearman in 1904 when he did his 
you know, nature at all ratio. And he believed that one day we would find a part of the, you know, of course, you know, in night and before we knew very little about the brain. And he said that one day we will find uh, a part of intelligence in the brain. Well, we never did. We don't have a lump of intelligence. Intelligence is a word that we devise to try to evaluate the responses that individuals give. That response does not prove where the ability comes from. There's a whole network of very complex backgrounds and factors. Um, so, the, so the child, first of all, we don't have intelligence. Secondly, intelligence has got nothing to do with school because school is only rules and, and learning to concentrate and work with those rules. And the ability of the child to work with those rules is dependent upon the, the mother, the whole background, the, ability, the way that they can control the learning environment so they don't feel pressurized. The teacher gives them the ability to believe in themselves, to ask questions and interrupt. And it's this ability to interrupt with the learning process that is the key to the child's development. If the teacher says, be quiet, listen to me, at the end, ask me questions, and one or two will put their hand up and the rest will try to hide, then, they, then that teacher has taught children nothing. Teaching, as I've explained in my mythology, is a way, I, I want to show the screen again, because I want to show you something if I can here. Um, now, okay, let me just see, uh, I'll be back. Um, uh, okay. Can you, can you see this classroom, this classroom, the organization of minds? Uh, yes. Rina? Yeah, okay. yeah, we can. Okay. Now, this is a political arrangement. Um, basically, if you understand the history behind education, there are, of course, a lot of good people who came up with good ideas about how children could learn from the adult, you know. Um, um, how you can explain things to a child. If you look at America, you've got John Dewey, who was a great pioneer in helping the child to understand information. But the educational system wasn't interested in that. All it wanted to do was to process kids, either to be the manager or the managed. And so they took the philosophy of Edward Thorndike at that time, who said that children should learn by repetition. Now Thorndike did his research on children on rats. He made experiments with rats and give them food or pain. And when he found that they responded more to pain than they did to food, then Thorndike said that the children should be beaten if they, if they don't put the effort into learning. I'm serious about this. <laughs> and so this idea of discipline came into the school. Sit down, get smacked, get hurt if you don't learn. Uh, I'm sorry to say that I was in northern India and I saw a teacher kicking and punching a student. Couldn't believe it. But anyway. Um, so, uh, and then of course, um, the, the technology, this is the key thing we need to talk about here. It's the technology that drives the society and the society drives the education. So the educate, so the children are more competent for the coming technology. This is why I studied technology. But as the technology began to change in the 1960s, so education realized it, did, it needed a different way for children to learn. So then they used, they, then they brought in the work of Jean Piaget. Now, Piaget gave the idea that children should learn by themselves. And his work came from studying snails, not children. Piaget studied how a snail changed the, shape, the color of its shell when it moved through different environments, pink, green, yellow, whatever. So then he reasoned that the child can adapt to an environment by its own interests. But that, again, tied the child to, its, its, to, its, to the way it had been developed. And therefore, that was said to be what they were inherited. But this is quite wrong. And then, uh, well, in the 1970s, the work of Lev Vygotsky from Russia became more prominent. And then we began to understand his uh, zone of proximal development, where the teacher takes the child from what they do not know and helps them to, and guides them to what they do know. This was the beginning of what we call mediation. And this is really one of the basis of my, my, my ideology, is to help the child to understand what they're doing. First of all, you have to make it a, a very happy, a very interactive uh, class where the children are allowed to interact, because that's the only way that they can change their mind. You know, if I say to you the word chair, you have an image of a chair in your mind, I have one in my mind. They're totally different. It's only by talking to each other can we come to a common agreement about what the church should be like in, our, in both of our minds. 
So if the teacher does not do this with the students, if they don't interact, if they don't get the children to interact question by question by question by question, then they're not developing their ability. So, I mean, just go from that classroom to this classroom. Now, at the back of the class, you see one girl, she can't see clearly, another girl can't hear clearly, but this girl in the front, she has this, she's connected with a personal persona of the teacher. Therefore, she feels more connected with the teacher, more positive and more happier to be with the teacher. Now, but what, what is the reality of education? I mean, look at this situation. I'm here in, in Nepal. These are rows of desks. This is the standard way that we teach. It is absolutely hopeless. What happens is that all these children, they can't interact, and I can't help them. The, the girls on the far right and the boys on the far left, I can't physically reach them. So this classroom inhibits my ability to educate them. It just enables the child, according to their home development and their drive and their ability to control the distracting factors to learn the rules that I'm teaching them. My job then is to collect all the textbooks and go to the classroom and mark them. But what really happens? Now look here, I went, <coughs> I went into one classroom and there was 40 textbooks that some teacher had done. I picked a one textbook. And the teacher had marked 40 lines. Yes, OK, OK, OK. And he scribbled something at the bottom like, see me, or very good, whatever. But look at these five lines here. The teacher said, it's OK. But if you look at the bottom paragraph, there are six red, red marks that he hadn't changed. He'd given no development to the child in those five lines. And remember, there were 40 lines and 35 kids in the class. So the children were not developed. They hadn't taught them anything. Now, if you go to a classroom like this, you know, uh, these are the, we have to change the standard design from that to that. Now, it's not always possible, but 90% of the times it is. And once you can change the, the classroom to, to that design, then you're changing the whole ability of the children to learn and the ability of the teacher to teach. Because now, the teacher can walk around, this is in Nepal, now the teacher can walk around to the children, they can help the children as they make that mistake, as they make this mistake, not one week later when the child's not interested, they can say, oh, it should be our country, not the country, because of a particular reason. And so the, the, once you have this design, then the teacher can help the children bit by bit, lesson by lesson, week by week, and the, uh, you will develop their ability. And we are not doing that. Now, this was a very crowded classroom, but we still managed to do it so the teacher could actually move between the rows of desks. And that's, that's one of the factors that we need to incorporate, is this design of the, of the classroom. Um, so that, that is fundamental. Um, sorry, one, one, one. So um, I would like to know the meaning of your Anderson attitude methodology. What exactly it is and how it works, because uh, uh, we have been discussing about how the schools are working, how the teachers are teaching, what the uh, sitting arrangement for students should be, what should be involved so that uh, students get better, how they engage with the students, how the students get engaged with the teachers. But now um, the main um, purpose that we've come together today is to explain to everybody what exactly is Anderson attitude of methodology? How it works, how it was how it originated, what made you develop this methodology? Well, it originated because I realized that children or students were not learning anything in the class. And it was a question of how can I help all the children to learn better? You can see on, on the screen this uh, classroom design. Now, of course, it's not new. I didn't develop this. But the point is, is that many teachers who have this kind of a classroom arrangement do not know how to use it. They sit in their desk. The meaning of this kind of arrangement is the teacher, like an actor, is moving around and stimulating the child en masse. And this way, the, child, the teacher has the attention of all the children. The teacher now can see that one child is not passing a note to another child or using a, a phone under the desk, and they're paying attention and they can catch the eyes. You know very well, when you're teaching, if you can see the eyes of the student, then you know what response you should expect from 
and how you should be teaching. If you're teaching somebody in the eyes of dead, you know you need to change your attitude. You can't do that with rows of desks where the eyes are kind of invisible. Uh, therefore, you just become a blah, 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 blah kind of teacher. But when you can move within them, when you're on a one-to-one -one basis, as this arrangement enables you to be, then you can watch the eyes, and then you can understand if you're teaching the right way or if you need to change your way of teaching. So basically what happened was that I realized that students need to be fun. It needs to be focused. It needs to be interesting. It needs to be personal for each student. It needs to feel that the teacher likes me, but likes all the people, and I can ask the question. So, for example, when the, okay, when the lesson begins, I, now, when I was in Japan, now remember I failed school completely when I was 17. I ended up as a lecturer in one of the best medical universities in Japan for nine years. My first year I had 60 students, and then it was about 80, 90, and then I had 130 in the third year. There were so many, I, 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 it was impossible, they were like this. I thought, how can I teach them? And I thought, I can't teach these students, there's too many. They have to teach each other. So I put them in a corridor. And I put them in two, this is a fantastic system that every teacher should incorporate this. I put them in two rows, row A and row B, so that every student has a partner, 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 partner. Now, the idea here is that the student in row A asks the partner in row B a question, and question, question, question. Now, after some time, you have to change it, otherwise it'll dry up. So I gave a signal like that. And then the, the, end, the student at the end of row B he moves to the, or she moves to the end of row B, and so that everybody shuffles up one space, so the partners change. And they ask questions, questions, and then again, questions, 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 or whatever. Now, in the beginning of a lesson, what should happen is that all the children knew exactly what happened in the last lesson, therefore they're interested to learn this lesson. That doesn't happen. The reality is they're not interested. They weren't interested in the last lesson, they're not interested, they have to come in. So they come in with a mind blank, you know? If you ask the student what happened last, last lesson, they have no idea. So you have to get their mind working before you actually teach them. So I use this idea of two rows to begin the lesson when they just talk, just for one or two minutes, just to get the mind going about something they, they knew or they didn't understand in the previous lesson. Then they sit down and then I try to tell them a story. If you can teach through a story content, you will capture their imagination. They will find something relevant about themselves in the story content. You know, there's a lot of examples, but we don't have the time to go into that right now. But, but develop a story or, or an anecdote or something that's human, that's personal, that takes you away from being the authoritor into a kind of a comrade. That's what you need. A comrade that they see as being equal but respectful because you know you have knowledge. And then explain to them, look, I know that your ability to concentrate is about 10, 15 minutes. And after that, the human brain loses concentration. So I'll make a deal with you. If you give me 10 minutes concentration, I will give you three or four minutes of yourself. You can do anything you want, but you must be quiet, not disturb the class or the room. And it works. <laughs> They'll do anything to get their freedom. So they'll concentrate for 10, 15 minutes, and they say, okay, relax, read a comic, whatever it is you do, but just be quiet. And they're talking friends. They say, okay, let's go back to the lesson. What did we do? And like that. And if you move through the lesson in that way, you've got them concentrating and asking each other and asking you what it was all about. So they're up to date with it. And then, of course, again, if you're moving through a long lesson and you begin to see them going, whoa, like that, put them in the rows, get them talking to each other. Of course, you have to monitor them to make sure they are asking questions about the lesson and not about oh, what was the movie like, or, you know, what you do on Saturday type of thing. And then at the end of the lesson, make a, make a competition. This is a quiz, this is great. You put them into groups, group A, B, C, or whatever, how many you've got, and you make questions about the things that you've learned in this lesson and they should have learned in the previous lesson. And they'll find out that by the questions that you ask them, they will actually see a different perspective to the information and learn it. So this is a question of really getting them to remember information. And I teach them, like, I, I use funny strategies, you know. Uh, so I was teaching, what was it? There was a Greek philosopher called Herodotus. And if I say the word Herodotus, it's got finished. But if you get everybody to say the word Herodotus, and everybody does their own version of that in a funny way, they don't forget it, you know. 
I was teaching my teachers uh, the length of the rivers, and I did it in such a way that they knew months later the length of the rivers. Um, and it's, it's this fun way of getting them to remember information. And remember, if they hold up, if they learn something by an emotional sense, then there's a picture of emotion in their mind, and they can keep with it. And then, then using that information is based upon the strategies that you help them to understand how to think, how to work with it. So I have a question so, in this. Uh, yeah. in between, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we have been uh, talking about uh, involving the students, helping them out. How, in your methodology, would you be able to help the teachers? If you could tell us some strategies, the teachers and uh, teachers who are watching us right now, hopefully they can imbibe them in their methodologies and make a little bit of difference. Because as much as I know, Anderson attitude of methodology of teach and it's an attitude methodology of teaching is completely different from the normal teaching method methodologies. To do that, a teacher needs to get imbibed into the course, the entire course, you know, she needs to imbibe it into it, into her or he or her. So how, how, uh, like uh, just a few pointers because I am getting uh, like uh, comments where uh, principals and teachers, they are wanting to know if you could tell some um, strategies, two or three strategies, you know, that can really help them improve their methodologies. Okay. I, I think in a very simple sense, uh, and you know, if you go to YouTube, Roy Anderson Education, there's nearly a hundred videos, they're all free, that I've made to help teachers about learning. The biggest thing is to try to create this type of a learning classroom environment. That's the biggest thing. And then to help the teacher to understand, to develop a kind of comradeship, not, not they are a figure of authority, but that they develop, a, so that they, they, they say to the students, look, we are going to learn this today. How can we learn it? What did, can you give me suggestions how you would like to learn it? so that you get the children responsible for their own lesson, their own learning. That makes them emotionally involved with it. Now, of course, you're going to have one or two students who are badly behaved, you know, the stupid boys. And so you need to put them in a way that they cannot play against each other. If you put a boy next to a girl, suddenly the boy stops messing around, you know, um, because they get embarrassed. This is a kind of a, a strategy. And, and if there is you know, I, I'm, I'm tired of going into a classroom and seeing the children who want to learn in the front row and the children who misbehave in the back row. You've got to change that. You've got to create an equal environment. And this kind of a desk arrangement enables you to do that. So try to use this arrangement. It's fundamental. I, I mean, you can't do it in all instances, but in a general learning sense, you can do. And then, and then get the teacher to explain through a sense of humor and interest and on a one-to-one -one basis about information. So it's a question of getting the teacher to, to accept that they are not the authority. You know, children today are smarter than we are. I was in Indonesia and one boy refused to go into his teacher because he said, I know, I know more about the information than the teacher he properly did. So rather than, we have to move away from this idea of the disciplinarian with a, you know, with a big stick. I mean, I was caned every Friday. I didn't learn anything. It's to get the, it's to get the teacher to be more human and more relaxed, make it a more happier. And remember the children today live in a very stressful, a toxic world. They are bombarded by pornography so that boys relate to girls in a, in a way that they don't understand when they're six years old. They're bullying, you know, they, they get pressurized and bullied by this. There's such so much pressure on the children today. We need to make it, the school environment a home, happy place, where the, te where the students regard the teacher as being the kind of guardian. But, but, but also, you know, and, and unfortunately, you know, in India, there are, it can be very big classes. You know, I've been into 50, 60 kids in my class. So you have to develop some kind of a way where the children can help each other. Where, where, you, where, the, where the smarter, the more developed ones can help those who are less developed. And so it is important to explain to the children that everybody is born equal, that everybody has the same potential. They have different abilities because they have grown and evolved differently. 
You know, we talk a lot about brain plasticity, but most people have no idea what it really means. Let me give you an example of brain plasticity. Um, where is it gone now? Um, if we go back to we, we shoot some screen sharing. I just this is a just a small topic. Um, Uh, the brain, it, it does not have a sex intelligence. But um, there was a, there was a, in 1980, there was a guy called Professor Lorber, and he noticed that one of his students in, in university had a rather large head. And he did a CAT scan on, on, on the brain of the student. Now, you can see on the top, there are two images. On the left-hand side, there's a normal brain. This is yours and mine. The white circumference that's the skull and inside is the brain matter but if you look at the brain on the right there's a black area in the middle now this is caused by hydrocephalus now hydrocephalus is um is a liquid that's produced through the brain system to protect the brain from damage when it bangs against the skull now there are four ventricles if one of these ventricles get blocked the, the cerebral fluid builds up and it squashes the brain it pushes the brain to the side so in the in the image on the right 95% of that brain matter is disappeared. It's been so condensed, there's only 5% left. Yet with that 5%, that same student had been able to obtain a, an IQ of 126 and um, first class honors degree in mathematics. How could it be possible? It became possible. Now, remember I told you there's a brain cell, brain cell, and, your, and synapse. If that synapse is stretched, I mean, you remember we're talking about fractions of millimeters here. If that is stretched, then the circuit breaks down. Because of the drive of that individual, because of his desire to want to learn, as his brain, as the synapse increased, so the dendrites, so the axons and dendrites kept up to keep this very precise distance between the brain cells to enable the brain to develop. So it basically comes down to psychology driving physiology. In other words, the belief of the student in themselves and their desire to learn creates the efficiency of the brain to do so. And so it's important for to teach for principals to explain to their teachers a little bit of what I've said here. If there is a child who's different, do not accept that difference, but try to find out where the difference began. Now, when I work with a student, and I work with a lot of you know, people, adults and children, I never explain to them, oh, look, this is how you do Pythagoras. No, no, no. I talk about them about life. You know, what's your favorite game? Do you like football? Do you like, you know, dressmaking or whatever it is? And find some common ground, some way that they will respect you as being their friend. And once you've got that respect and that relaxation, remember, then they're calm, then they're relaxed. Because otherwise their brain is, ooh, and can't learn. But once they're relaxed and happy and they believe in you, then you've got to sit, take them right to the, to the beginning of what they didn't understand, explain that, and build up and, it, and you know you can like i showed you with the drawing of that girl in two weeks she produced something that for eight years teachers couldn't do and i've had the same thing with teaching you know mathematics pythagoras and anything like that it's it's the belief in the teacher that every child has the same potential and a desire for the teacher to want to help them unfortunately not a lot of teachers have that. There are fantastic teachers, but teachers are, are like everybody else. There's average teachers, and there's teachers who should not be teaching. And the teacher who shouts at a child in the classroom, they're the ones who need to get another job, and quickly. Because teaching is not just about teaching a child how to do mathematics. It is about preparing a, a future citizen, a person in the future who will be able to be a responsible person in their society. Okay, so, uh, um, sir, I uh, I have a confusion because you've been to the schools in India as well, right? You've been, uh, uh, like, uh, you have uh, even trained some teachers in India. Uh, sir, you are quite aware that our schools, uh, our classrooms are overcrowded. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. I said it. I said it. 50 or 60. Yeah. I know it. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, sir, but do you think, uh, like, in the uh, structure, the walls, in fact, the entire classroom structure is quite small. So do you think the um, structure uh, of the sitting arrangement that we are talking about, is that possible in our schools? Because what happens is, like, we have limited space. The numbers are more. How, yeah, how do we go about it? Okay. Um, what was that? Called? Okay. Um, like, you know, what I, I, I explained when we did that uh, classroom that in about 90% of the cases, it's not possible, you know, because it's too crowded. But if you look at this one, this was, what was this? This was in North of India. Um, this one here. I mean, there were so many kids in that class, I thought it's impossible. But we did manage somehow to get it in such a way that the teacher could actually move through. So the teacher did have the, the physical contact with each child to say, you know, oh, do you understand this? Let me help you, whatever. And then so it, it is possible, but it's not always possible. And sometimes you just have to accept the, the rows of desks. That's life, you know. Yes. But if it's possible, yeah. so change it. So, so uh, what would you suggest the school management and uh, even uh, uh, like uh, because you being an educational expert, you've been doing it. Like, what would you suggest that uh, can the uh, what measures can be taken that can really help in building this kind of uh, seating structure? Um, if it's possible, change the size of the classes. Make classes smaller um, and maybe perhaps alternate um, uh, the learning so, so that some children come at one time and then children come at a different time. That's one possibility. Um, so it's a question upon the, the flexibility that's desired, which of course is hindered by finance. Everything is education is about finance. Um, but if, if, so, okay, if it's possible, change the desks in such a way as I've demonstrated here. If it's not possible, is it possible to short, to make the classes smaller? So, so you have 30 kids and then 20 kids. Instead of having one class of 50, you have one yeah, class because, of 50. Because over here, in India, over here in India, we have section systems. So uh, directly or indirectly, you mean to say that we need to make another section, keep the section numbers limited, and do not overload the class. We don't, we don't overstuff the class. I have a question from Dr. Radha Singh. Uh, I think that's what we've been discussing also. In a large classroom, there is vast syllabus and limited time. How do we practice this one-to-one -one interaction uh, like that? Like you mentioned, uh, we can have uh, eye contact with the students. Because once we enter the class, we are just glued to the books. Because we need to get it done as soon as possible, we have 45 minutes. Out of 45 minutes, I guess, according to me, it's just 38 minutes that is effective teaching. Oh, this is a very important point you raise. And, and of course, in my methodology, I really explain to the teachers, do not use textbooks. Do not use textbooks. Take the textbooks and throw it away. Because when you tell the children to open page 45, their ability to understand 45 will rely upon how well they understand page 44, 43, 40, 35, page 20, but also the language of the textbook. Some children, remember, education is language. So some children will struggle to understand what it means. Others will understand immediately. The way to teach is for the teacher to know exactly what's on those pages in that textbook and design a way of explaining those points in, in the language of the children by talking about it and by demonstrations and then by interaction. So, you know, there was one class I did, it was, was it Gravity, I think it was. And there was about 13 pages in the textbook. I condensed that into one and a half pages, the essential points, and I explained those in the language and with physical interactions so that every single student knew exactly what the content of that was. And then they were then asked to go and study it further. And they wanted to do that because they understood what it was what it was about. It was fun because they'd understood something. Um, so, so, so the important point here, and I'm so glad you raised this, 
is to get teachers to put their effort into taking the book, spending a bit of time, and they'll get better and better as they do it, to, un right. to, to recognize the key, the, the, the key points of this lesson, to take those out and explain them in the language and of the children with an interaction. Question, 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 answer question. So in a way, in a way again, uh, in a way, again, uh, like uh, in my previous talks also, we've been promoting experiential learning. Okay. Right. Uh, uh, like uh, it's not promoting rather. I would say most of us, we've come up with the view that experiential learning is more important than theoretical learning. And that is what that is what helps our students also to learn better. What would you say on that? Well, remember what I've explained to you before is that school is just a question of rules. You know, it begins and it begins day one. Hold the pen this way. Don't hold it this way. Don't hold it on your left hand, whatever, you know. Hold the paper this way. Everything is rules, 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 rules. The ability to think is dependent upon rules, to know how to imagine information moving. It's based upon the rules that you've been taught how to do this. So for me, um, you, this terminology, the, these ideas, uh, it, it's, it, it's not really my interest. My interest is helping the child to understand the point of, of the learning. So, and so, some so, are so, theoretical uh, so and some are practical. Let's come to Anderson attitude methodology. How, uh, like, how can the teachers, like, what is the time duration that the teacher needs to get equipped with this methodology? Second, how helpful is it in imbibing education in a child, like imbibing the way a child learns? Third, there are three questions. The last one is, last one is, how effective is Anderson attitude methodology? Okay, could you? <laughs> I've lost my concentration. Could you please give me the one by one? Please? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, question one. Question one. How is it that teachers are going to be benefited by Anderson attitude methodology? First, now you answer that. Okay. I'll, okay. I'll put the other one. Okay. okay. Uh, the teacher will benefit from it because the students will benefit from it because the students will understand better. The students will therefore have more respect for the teacher. It'll be more of a happier learning environment. And remember, stress is a big factor here. It'll be a happier, more responsible in learning environment. And the teacher will enjoy their job more because they will feel a sense of achievement. There's, they'll recognize their students are learning better and easier. <laughs> okay. Now, the second Thanks question, question. The second question uh, how are the teachers going to be benefited after taking the Anderson methodology, how they imbibe it in them, and how will they benefit from them? Oh, well, I just answered that. Did you ask me the wrong question? <laughs> it is one question. I, I, I just how, answered that. We can say, we yeah. can say it. Uh, overall, how is Anderson Attitude Methodology going to help our teachers? OK. First of all, let's be very serious about this. The design of school today is to produce a 19th century model citizen. A citizen who is not designed to think too much. You know, there was a Woodrow Wilson, 1919, something like that. He publicly stated that we want one class of people to be educated and another class to be less educated because we want some to be professional class and others to be workers. And now this is nothing new. The whole educational structure is designed on this idea that some children will be promoted to greater responsibilities in society. Now, the way that it does this is that school teaches children, raises children on dualistic thinking, yes and no. What is the answer? I know. What is the answer? I don't know. Answer. No. Who knows the answer? Who knows the answer? Good. Tell everybody the answer. <laughs> when the child knows the answer, the teacher is so wrong to use that child to explain the information to the rest of their friends because they're not interested in this point. These children, they don't want to hear his explanation. And and they can't relate to how well he's explaining his mind. So this idea of using one student to explain to other students who don't understand is, is, is totally wrong. Okay. Um, 
So, um, I've got losing my thread here. Um, so, we, uh, as, I, I, as I explained to you, the benefit of the teacher is that, is that they're more successful in their job. And the school is more successful because the school, of course, is fighting for a, a recognition of the league tables being the better school because it produces kids with better grades. Now, we have a big movement in education that they should not just, it's not just about learning grades, it's about learning how to think. This is fundamental to what I'm trying to explain here. The reader is not just passing, is not just helping kids to, to pass grades, but then they don't understand what this is. To get good grades relies on two factors. Number one, you memorize information. Excuse me. And number two, you learn exam strategies. That's it. If you memorize and you know strategies, you can get good grades. But that doesn't mean that you know how to, you're understanding how to think about that. So there's a meaning of, uh, I got a great, uh, yeah, well, I can find it. But so we need to help children to understand not just why they're learning something, but the applications of what they're learning to real life situation so they can understand it easier, um, which is the practical aspect that you're talking about and not the theory. Um, so, you know, you know, I have uh, principals and teachers from 17 countries, and I've got a lot of testimonies um, about how they found it would really help them and how it helped children to, to learn better. And, and I can show you these if you want to see them. Um, no, I have I have nearly seen all the things that, you know, you've been talking about right now. Because if you remember when you were here in India, we had gone through the presentation also that you were uh, recently, recently showing us. And uh, we had seen a lot. We, we had brainstormed a lot rather. So, uh, like, uh, my last question for this is about Anderson Attitude Methodology is, like, how can we get our teachers you know the interested ones to get involved in this methodology so that they can benefit themselves they can benefit the students and they can definitely try and bring a change i tried to um when i began this purpose in my life it was to help children to learn better so that they would all children would have a a chance of, of reaching their dream, whatever it was. But once I got involved in the mechanics of the educational and social system, so I realized that we are not preparing the child of today for the real world that they will live in. And I would like to talk about that in a moment. So I developed an online course. It's eight modules. And um, uh, so, you know, there's and it's great, you know, you just join this introduction, explains the What's What's the time yeah. duration? Uh, what's the time? Because uh, you said it's eight modules. Oh, What's the time yeah, duration? Yeah. Okay, it, it, it's up to the teacher. It's up to the individual. Um, you know, if you want to go through it, you can get through it. And it's about 45 hours. But you can do it condensed or you can take it over a year, whatever. It, it's up to the individual as they've got the time to, to do it. Because, of course, okay. you know, teaching can be very stressful, you know, at such times. Exactly, you know. exactly. Um, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, and how... If, uh, yes, sir? No, you wanted sorry, to no. say something? You wanted to say no, something? No, no, it's okay. Yeah. How, will, the, uh, how no. will education be like after this pandemic is over? Wow, that's a really good question. And a very disturbing one. If you consider all that I've explained to you, the importance of the child being sensitive in how they analyze information is the key factor to their development. This sensitivity is based on a human element, a belief in themselves and, uh, and support from another human being. I like what you're doing. This is very good. This is great. There's a woman called Carol Dereck, and she spent 30 years analyzing the, the, the effect of the teachers on the child. And she found out if the child's, if the teacher says to the child, that's great, you're good, that created a static in, uh, mindset. It's, I'm great, good, that's fine, finished, I'm great. But if the teacher said to the child, 
this is this looks really interesting or i like what you're doing and that causes a development in the mind the child then wants to interact more and develops themselves by it so this this role is fundamental so basically what i'm saying here is that we have now moved into an online situation a lot of businesses have grown up selling these bits you know you can teach online you can do assessments online whatever and the school system, the bureaucracy, the accountants have brought into this. But this, this is not developing the mind and the heart of the child. Anybody who learns online is limited in this personal development. So anybody can learn, you know, this and this, and press the button and understand it. But the desire to learn it, the motivation to want to learn it, the motivation to want to achieve comes from here, and this comes from somebody telling you, telling them that I love you. You know what I mean. That you, you're doing great. This is very interesting, and that human element we must never lose in education. You know, in America they have developed this virtual classroom idea because they've got a very serious problem. In the West we lose so many teachers. America loses 200,000 200, teachers every year, every year, because the, of the stress of the job of the factors like that low pay whatever so it's the same in england and, and in europe we're losing teachers so fast now this means that the accountants in education think great whether we can lose a human teacher that's great because we don't have to pay them if we buy a software program the kids can learn from the software program this is terrible if that happens and it is happening now and this online uh, teaching is going to encourage that kind of online education, then the children will lack that personal human being. So you'll no longer have a teacher with 30 or 50 kids. You'll have one supervisor with 100 children typing away and the supervisor, stop talking, be quiet, work. There'll be no human being. And this is something we must never lose. Because we're talking, we're not just talking about kids learning, we're talking about the ability of the future human being in their society. And you see it now. You pick up a phone and you call and say, oh, I've got a problem. Oh, yes, sir, what's your problem? Oh, I'm sorry, it's not box. It doesn't go into this box. It doesn't go into this box. It doesn't go into this box. I can't help you. Well, okay, can I talk to the manager? Do you know the manager's name? No, well, you can't talk to the manager. Press the phone down. You know, we're losing this humanness. And it's so important, especially now we're moving into a world that's going to be controlled, not just dominated by artificial intelligence. So when we're teaching these kids this dualistic uh, yes and no, this dualistic idea, so what is this? What should I do? We're teaching them to be dependent upon authority, which is the plan of education, so that you have the mass of society who are dependent on their reasoning on a smaller um, group of people who were trained to who are better trained to administer their responsibility but so we have the manager and we have the managed now what's happening now is that artificial intelligence is now changing this so we have artificial intelligence and human intelligence and this is becoming more and more and more prominent in our interaction it's taking over the, our social orientations it's taking over our work availability and this is a great problem. We talk about now in, in the next 30 years, predicted that 50% of jobs will be taken over by artificial intelligence. We have people saying, well, we create other types of jobs, but they don't understand what nanotechnology really is. And if you understand that, then you realize there really will be very, very little jobs in the future. And at the same time, the population is expanding. So the, the purpose here uh, for me, my initial drive was to help all children to learn better. But once I understood how the system worked, my drive now is to help schools to change this dualistic thinking into evaluators thinking. So the children are raised through two, not what, not the word what, but through two words, how and why. Now the word what is used in the cerebral cortex, this big part here. This is where the word what happens. What should I do? What is this? But if you have the emotional content, like how and why, then that's contained in the limbic system underneath. And, and if you and the brain develops by its experience. So if you use these words, how and why more, then this part of the brain will become larger, more competent. But then, and the, the problem then is, it's not just teaching the children to use the word how and why, it's to, it is for the teacher to know how to handle 
student to ask that question, which changes a mindset in them. And for the teacher to be able to give them the confidence to say, excuse me, sir, why are you saying that? Or excuse me, sir, how can that be? And, Basically, and we, we, need to, we need to develop the inquisitiveness of the child to get yeah. the courage to ask the teacher why and how. Basically. Well, exactly the because point. Exactly the point. Now, now, let me answer that. It's really interesting. There was a study done by NASA. And NASA found out that they gave children questions. And before they went to school, 98% of the remarks by the children were genius level. They were geniuses. You know, 98% of those kids prior to going to school, their responses were genius level. In the first, after the first five years, it had dropped to 30%. And after 10 years, it had dropped to 12%. And by the time all those children finished school, only 2% still had this genius capability. School had destroyed the imagination. School had destroyed the value that you're talking about. How? Because school works on rules. And if you don't learn the rules, you don't understand what's happening and you give up. And therefore, you stop your imagination and you stop your inquisitiveness and you stop your creativity. So to combat that, we need teachers to understand how school works on rules and make sure that all children know those rules and keep up with them, even when they lost them from the last lesson or the last year, and keep it going. Keep these rules alive in the minds of the students so they know. They know the information and they know how to use that information. They know how to apply it. It's all rules. So that's what, like, uh, I think uh, we are almost done with everything because we've already gone around half an hour ahead of our scheduled time. Uh, last question. What keeps the drive in you alive? What is it that drives you day in and day out that you are doing wonders every day? Well, I, I think I could say it's a smile on the child's face when you know that they, they realized something that they didn't believe in themselves. But it is more importantly, as I've just explained to you now, that we are moving into a world that we have no idea what it will be. We do know that artificial intelligence, as I've just mentioned, is not just taking over the jobs that we can do it's redesigning our social orientation, how we can live within a society, what freedom we can have, how responsible we will be. Now, this way of school, it develops, as I've mentioned, a 19th century ideology, where the mass are taught not how to think from here, from, they think from here. I don't like this, therefore I fight. I don't like this, therefore I go and attack. We need to develop this reason so they come out of the situation and they can understand it better. So we need to teach the children how and why, to understand a greater reason. For, so that as citizens in their world, where it will be controlled by artificial intelligence, it's already nearly that now, they will be able to maintain a sense of harmony and a sense of social responsibility. And if they do not do that, if we don't do that, if we just keep producing the same kids that we've been doing for the past 150 years, then society will say, these human beings cannot be controlled, therefore we must control them with more security, more surveillance, and less democracy. So we need to, to realize that teaching is not just teaching the kids how to do mathematics, it is to prepare them with an adaptable and agile mind so they can respond to a world where their self-responsibility, how they think and how they behave, will be severely judged. And remember also that you know, right now this pandemic has caused so many economic problems, so many problems for people. But these are short-term problems. What is really happening is that God, whatever religion you believe in, it's the same God, of course, God has created a world that's getting better. The planet is healing itself. You know, the city that I'm in, the pollution was so bad in the winter, you couldn't see the sky. It was just a thick smog. Now we can see stars at nighttime. And it's the same around the world. This, you know, the level of pollution has come down. The ionosphere is, is beginning to heal itself. And perhaps we are saving humanity 
by this pandemic. Um, and so, however, as we know, human beings, as soon as it's finished, we'll start producing the pollution again, blah, blah, blah. And then we will visit again that the ice fields in the Arctic and Antarctic are dissolved, water level will rise. Glaciers in the mountains are dissolving, drying up. So there's less water to feed the mountain people. So at some time in the future, we're going to have people from the coastal areas moving inland, people from the mountains moving down, so that you'll be a mass of people all struggling, trying to find security, trying to find a way of a decent life where there won't be enough availability and a tremendous amount of people coming together. And if we do not teach the child today how to be more responsible to themselves and to the social and world environment, then they will live in a world very heavily controlled so that they do not have the freedom that we take for granted right now. Right, right. I think we had a wonderful session and I'm sure all our teachers might have gained a lot from what you've uh, said and definitely we will try and get acquainted to Anderson uh, attitude of methodology because that is really going to help our teachers and it will really help our students as well because once the teachers are equipped with it, they can definitely work hard with the students. Thank you so much for sparing your precious time with us and I would definitely like, like you to show the books that you've written one by one. Really? Oh, well, okay. Yes. Um, so that so that okay. they can they can note down the names and if they want to read them they can order it through. I think it's available on Amazon also. Yes, it is. It is. It is. Yeah. And so they can. You can, they can. Just, you can help me to distribute them too. The first one is called the illusion of education. As I explained to you, this explains why school is not about teaching children how to learn. It is about preparing a future citizen based on a 19th century political design. The Hidden Secrets of Intelligence is more is an academic kind of detective book. But all of these books were written in such a way that the normal parent would enjoy them. I, I began, as I explained, to write academic books, but I changed this language into a story type of language so that people can enjoy but understand the relevance of what we're talking about. This book explains that any normally born child does have the same potential within school and within society regardless of their color or their ethnic origins. The brain environment complex offers a new concept to what intelligence is and explains the reality of the environment. Of course, it all comes down to love, or what I call mediation, the ability of the parent and the teacher to instill confidence and inspiration. And that's all it is. That's all it is. And then, of course, we do need a new kind of world education. And here I talk about the probable reality of nanotechnology developing and how scary it can really be. But also then, of course, we need a new curriculum. The subjects that we've got today in school were designed in the 19th century. We need new subjects and we need new interpretations of why we're teaching these subjects. For example, we teach history. And in history, children are told to memorize dates and people. It's boring. But once they realize the social fact behind those dates and the people involved, then it becomes interesting. And then we begin to understand the significance of learning history because in those lessons, they can help, they have the ammunition to solve the future problems. And then we have memoirs of a happy teacher. People love it. So they say it should be the Bible of teachers. And I, uh, I don't know, I would love to read some of it. it it's, it's really anecdotes of teaching kids, helping parents and helping teachers who just got lost in the system. And five ways for better grades, five ideas of how any student at any age can be more successful in the educational system. Thank you so much, Roy. Thank you so much, Roy, for uh, being on our platform. And we teachers have definitely learned a lot from you. And because as far as I know, you're a very good storyteller also. So <laughs> I would invite you, I would again invite you because uh, all, over, all over the world, the schools are closed down. There is very less work. So I think you can engage the students, in fact, the children in storytelling sessions, 
we will be having storytelling sessions from i guess 17th or 18th of july we will be starting with our theme let's indulge in stories for kids and uh, i would definitely like to invite you for that i would love to come uh, if if i can fit into my schedule yeah i'd love to come absolutely thank you so much thank you so much for being there with us namaste thank you. namaste namaste so this was mr roy anderson and he has really given us some insight into what exactly a teacher should be and how we should go about tomorrow again 5:30 pm we will be here with uh, mrs manju singhania she is the founder director for joy of learning dehradun she is an expert in many many ways she has uh, she has got a vast profile it's not uh, easy to discuss it here the topic for tomorrow is going to be the effect of online education for preschoolers thank you namaste